we'd like to uh, welcome you all out today. We have a treat with Professor with a uh, presentation by Professor uh, Saeed Ned Luf. Uh, get my eyeballs on here so I can read the bio. <coughs> this is what happens you get out early. Uh, Saeed is a, a native of Morocco where he lived and studied until his early 20s. He's traveled extensively through Europe before coming to the U.S. to attend university. Said is a multi, multilingual professional experience in all facets of interpretation and translation with emphasis on French and, French and Arabic. Said has several years experience translating and interpreting for law enforcement before operating in the intelligence area um, and later on becoming part of the cadre of instructors for Fletzi in the same domain. So he helps us out uh, over here at Fletzi and Roddy by the way. So, Said. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Oedi. I uh, appreciate the, uh, the introduction and actually helping me through this process to get it started. I, I, don't, I don't think it's really... Can you guys hear me well? Mm -hmm. Is good? Okay. Now, all of you guys as near the critics, right? It's not really about the topic, right? No, no. I, I hope it's about both. It's okay. But, uh, but no, thank you. Thank you very much for coming here to listen to me. It's an opportunity. I, uh, I usually do this stuff uh, not at the university, but at Flexi, smaller groups and all. So it is an experience for me, as it is for you guys. Again, it's an honor uh, to give you, share with you some of my thoughts, my ideas. And uh, I want to start by saying this. Uh, I know you guys hear this word a lot. There are experts on this and experts on that, on terrorism, the Center for uh, uh, Middle Eastern Studies, the Center for Strategic Studies, and all these big talking heads, the big think tanks, right? They're big. They can think big boxes. They have uh, a lot of budgets and what have you. Let me challenge you. I don't believe in that. Have they fixed any problems? Have they made us any safer or better? I don't think so. I don't think so. This is not a science. It's not exact science. It's not mathematics. We're not doing here any uh, scientific research where the answers are exact and correct. It's not. This is a social thing, a human thing. And I, for once, I'm not going to tell I'm an expert. I'm not. I'm not. I know what I know because I am the son of this culture that you guys hear about. Islamic, Arabic, Middle Eastern, all that stuff. I was born in that. I know it. It's me. I know what I know because I've done it. I worked in the field, as Dr. Wade said, I traveled to many places, and this is an area of interest to me, so I know stuff about it. But I challenge you, you guys, to do your own research. Don't believe what they tell you on TV, don't believe what they tell you in the social networks, don't believe in none of that stuff. Do your own, study, get involved in this thing because, because it will affect your lives now and in the future. Uh, terrorism, is here with us to stay, uh, here, simple uh, uh, reality. So uh, you guys and this generation and the one after, and I don't know how many, will have to deal with that. OK, I, uh, I have a stuff in a uh, PowerPoint pro uh, projection. I'm not going to go through everything. It's very quick. Normally, I, uh, we work through this throughout the day with uh, smaller groups, but I'll try to give you maybe a six cent, a little bit of uh, of the presentation, focus on some key points, in my opinion, that are, that are had to be uh, addressed. Definitions, the root causes, future trends, but also misconceptions. There are a lot of misconceptions about this stuff. So, I'd like to ask somebody if they can give me a definition. I, I know my friend, uh, Mr. Wells, tell, give, me, give me a definition of terrorism. What is it to you? I want to hear from somebody in the audience. It's an act of aggression directed at a specific political, geopolitical force. Yeah, it's a good one. I'll, I'll buy that. Well, here's one of the definitions. This is by the FBI. I guess they're the authority when they investigate these things. That's what's going on right now in uh, New York and Indiana. Uh, and basically what you're saying, it's an act of aggression, uh, violence, uh, it's unlawful, 
and its use for coercion to intimidate uh, for a political, religious purpose, what have you. Uh, but here I made a note. One's terrorist is another one's freedom fighter, isn't it? What I'm suggesting to you, a definition is not static. It's not, that's not set in stone. If you ask somebody fighting in the Middle East, if you ask an Iraqi guy somewhere in Baghdad where it is a Shia government, right, that is in charge, and they're oppressing the Sunni guys, they've invaded their homes, their sanctities, they're pulling the women out of the, the, the homes and doing all kinds of bad stuff, and those guys will pick up arms to fight. And because they cannot fight by themselves, they have to join a group, all of a sudden that group now is a terrorist group, and the guy is called a terrorist. But he's fighting to uh, defend his home, as an example. You ask somebody in Palestine, they occupy territory, they tell you they're fighting to gain the independence. And yet, if they are part of Hezbollah or part of uh, the PLO, well, they classify as a terrorist. I am not going to advocate one or the other. I'll leave it up to you. I'm just saying, open your mind. Open your mind. Think about it. Okay. <coughs> Take a second to read that. Words are huge. Okay. I have to sit back and read. Uh, well, he, here is a, a number of events that happen throughout time, modern time, modern time or so, that are constituting or are, uh, are char characterized as terrorist attacks. <coughs> and uh, uh, with leading up to September 11, a couple of things change. A couple of change, things change. The the the, the mass. The amount of the killing, the casualties, it's huge. That's a terrible thing. But also, if you look at all the other events before, five, six attacks, maybe more, uh, they were uh, about some purpose, something local. Either in that Rajneeshi group in, in, uh, in, I think, in Northern California somewhere, or the Om Shirinko, the sarin attack in uh, Japan. These were. Um, sort of localized. With the advent of Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden, we are now talking about what? A global phenomenon. A global thing. They are not concerned with uh, the Middle East or Afghanistan or Pakistan or globally. They are fighting the infidels. They are fighting the West, the hegemony of the Western uh, Christian and Jewish coalition. When Osama bin Laden was calling for the attacks on the, on the US back in 1990, in his declaration of the jihad, he says, you know, until these guys leave our uh, territories and, and, and uh, uh, give us the peace we deserve, we're not going to give them peace anywhere. They are not safe anywhere. So we like to call that in, in academia is a paradigm shift. Things have changed. We are talking about global terrorism. OK. There's a common factor that binds all of these events from 9-11, Waco, uh, a factor linked to ancient terror groups. They do not care about worldly or secular ends. They do not fit into the mold of terrorism we are used uh, to fighting. Uh, basically, the, the same idea. It, it's, it's, it's global, and uh, it's not uh, uh, Concerned with one territory or one or with any uh, uh, borders. Okay, some theory definitions. Uh, rational terror, the end desired is feasible, realistic, and open to political resolution. Irrational terror, the end desired is unfeasible, not negotiable. With the latter, you can arrest, interdict, or kill them. That is all. You have no option. Um, uh, the idea there is. Um, if you talk to the, some of the jihadi guys, and I've done some, some of that, and I've had the, the opportunity to talk to these guys in my line of work, and they will tell you, they will tell you, tell to you like this. We don't care. The jihad will continue till the end of time. The apocalyptic vision of 
an end of the world. They don't want to negotiate, they don't want any resolution, they, they see the end of the world and they want to hasten that. They want to see that happen, they want to work on doing that themselves. So you can't, I mean, you can't do anything. Is this stuff moving without me doing anything? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Goodness. <laughs> okay. Uh, that is the next thing. Transcendently informed, apocalyptic, uh, they can justify mass destruction. Again, uh, that's the aim. It's to bring mass this, uh, uh, destruction and end the world, basically. I mean, uh, if they had access to nukes, they would have used them. Uh, the 9 11 is a good example. We're not looking for killing one or two guys, they want thousands of killed. Okay, who's a terrorist and what are the factors and the misconception? Um, well, uh, an easy answer to that question is that everybody can be. Anybody can be, right? Uh, the misconception that these guys uh, are a lot of times loners, uh, socially inadequate, they cannot fit in the society, they're on the margin, on the margin, they just don't want, they, they hate anybody else to want to do something. Not exactly. Uh, most of these guys have families, right? Look at uh, the San Bernardino that happened uh, early on in the year. A guy is married, he's got a child, he's got a new wife and everything. And yet decides he's gonna do a terrorist act and, and take people out of himself in, in, the, in the process. Uh, Osama bin Laden, as the main uh, terrorist, if you wanna call it so, uh, he was a, a businessman, he had a great company, he was making billions, I mean millions of money and all that stuff. His uh, henchman or second in command, Dr. Ayman al Zawahiri, a doctor, an eye doctor, who swore the uh, Hippocratic oath to heal and cure people, and yet he chose terror. So, this man may have wives, children, and what have you, but uh, at some point, something happened, something clicked, and decided, decided that that's what they, they want to do. They want to become terrorists. Uh, I'm going to skip this stuff. I, uh, and by the way, I, I ask that you may get a copy of the, uh, of the material if you want to. Um, okay. Uh, the example of Sawai Harry and uh, what have you, I talked about that. Um, uh, let me address the, the, the point of, of, of uh, uh, when they talk, they become terrorists because they want to fight the infidel. There's a misconception there. A lot of people think, or tend to think, that Islam and Muslims are against Christians or Jews. Far from the truth. Far from the truth that could be. A, I, I'm a Muslim man, right? I'm Muslim. I cannot be Muslim until I recognize Jesus, Moses, Abraham, and all the prophets before them. Until I recognize Christianity and Judaism as predecessors to, to Islam. So we speak from the same book. The infidel notion that justifies the killing or the fighting or the jihad uh, comes later on when the extremists or the fundamentalist thinkers would say, well, the Christians or the Jews, they are astray from their book. They're not practicing their book. They change stuff. And now they become enemies of God. Kafir, as we like to call it. And, and so that justifies uh, the killing and fighting uh, others. But that's only a minority, a small group of people that subscribe to that. I mean, the, the terrorism is Jihadists. They don't. They don't represent us. They don't represent me. Uh, if anything, I, I don't. I don't want to put a value or a percentage, but but maybe what a five to ten percent, maybe of people out there with those uh, that kind of ideology. But uh, as it always is the case in any other faith or 
It's that small minority that is more vocal and more fatal. But the rest of the people, they, they like you and me. They want to live in peace and they want to prosper and uh, do well uh, like everybody else. family, our culture, history, personal factors. Uh, again, religion, because if you meet the religion in, a, in an extremist way, that will give you uh, 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 means or the, the, uh, the desire to fight. Um, family, in the Arab culture, the family is, is tight. Uh, we, uh, we don't we don't, uh, we don't act like individuals as we are here. We're very liberal in, in, in the West, for instance, and uh, there's uh, individual freedoms and what have you. Back at home, it is all centered around the family, is respected to the uh, elder, what have you. That things are not, that there's not a whole lot of leniency. Uh, we have a history of conflict. We have a history of conflict, and that, that's, that gives uh, ammunition for those who want to fight. The, the conflicts that not, have not been resolved, by the way. Uh, and obviously there are personal factors. Let me address the, the personal factors one. Um, and you guys have heard about the, uh, uh, the martyrdom, or we call it in the West, suicide operations. In the Middle East, or for the jihadi guys, that's a martyrdom. What's a martyrdom? You are sacrificing yourself, right, for your cause. Sacrificing yourself. The most precious things, whatever you have, that's what you're going to sacrifice. Uh, people in your guys' age group, but even younger, 17, 18, they don't want to see the next day. They, want, they don't want to see the future. They don't want to have wives. They don't want to have wives and children. They want to end their lives right there and then. A tall order, right? Not many people can do that. But you can justify that in your mind by saying what? You are getting the greater rewards. If you are a martyr, you go to the hereafter paradise. There is no judgment for you. You enter free, free pass. Not only that, you can seek forgiveness to members of your family as you wish. Your family the people we leave behind, all of a sudden now they are at a higher sort of status in the communities, in places like Iraq, Palestine maybe more so, uh, where a, a martyr's picture is plastered on the walls. Yeah, we, you, you walk in the neighborhoods and you see the name of all the guys that have died and their families are superheroes. Cool. And they get the money and what have you. The, 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 the groups that sponsor the they will take care of that family too, as long as you live. But uh, again, these are personal factors. Uh, if you are fundamental, fundamental and uh, extremist, then that, that's what you want. You want the biggest thing you can get in, in, from your faith, which is to enter paradise. So you are ready to sacrifice yourself for that. Okay, uh, I want to talk about a, 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 the, another misconception that I personally uh, don't like very much. Uh, when people say uh, these guys, the extremists, the jihadi guys who are fight, fighting us, the terrorists, they hate our way of life. They hate our way, way of life, what we stand for, our freedoms, our democracy, and what have you. Not exactly true, not exactly true. Uh, let me suggest this to you. Uh, look at the flow of immigrants right now going from Iraq, from Syria, from many places in the Middle East. They are not going to neighboring countries. They're not going to Saudi, they're not going to Qatar, they're not going to Dubai, and there's money there. 
They're all going west. West, yeah. They're going west. The west they despise. They're going west. They're going to Greece and the <coughs> Germany, coming to the US. They want the opportunity. They want the freedoms we have. The opposite. They want the freedoms we have. Because they don't have them back home. They want the opportunity to live and to prosper. So what's the issue? It's more, it's more, in my opinion, this is an opinion of one man, it's more about the policy, about what the US and other allies are doing out there. Okay? Perceived in the Middle East as not fair policies. We don't foster a lot of friendship, a lot of collaboration. What are we doing in the Middle East for the most part? Well, I'll tell you, we're sending guns and weapons and Hats and I mean, uh, I don't have to, uh, to preach to you about how many fronts we're fighting in, still in Iraq, still in Afghanistan, in Syria, involved in the, in the war between Yemen and, and uh, Saudi Arabia. So these are the kinds of things that motivate these guys and makes them want to do something about it. Um, And, and that's a, a major one, really. I, uh, that seg segues in my other example. Uh, an issue that you guys may or may not be aware of, there's an ongoing uh, struggle, a conflict in Palestine between the Jewish state and the Palestinian. Uh, a focal point, if you want. It's really the center that rallies a lot of these guys who advocate uh, this type of thing with terrorism and what have you. As a matter of fact, Osama bin Laden himself, in his declaration for war against uh, the Christian and Jewish uh, coalition, he called about, upon the Palestinians and the rest of the world, the rest of the, 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 the Muslims, to free Palestine because Palestine is under occupation. We, uh, there is, uh, we call them occupied territories. That suggests that somebody is somewhere where they're not supposed to be. You hear the term of uh, uh, illegal settlements. There's the word illegal. Something that's not illegal, that's something that's not legit. But it's happening. Uh, don't get me wrong. I'm not going to turn this into a bashing of the Jewish state or something. That's not true. That's not really what, what, what it's about. Uh, uh, neither is it something about anti-Semitism or what have you. That is not a, a thing. Certainly not with me. I am Semitic. I come from Morocco. My ancestry is Jewish, as a matter of fact. I'll say. I am Muslim, but my, my ancestry is Jewish. Before the Arabs came to Morocco, there were Berber, Berbers, natives of the land, and I am a Berber. Partly. And I know from our history, there was a lot of Jewish culture there, uh, Jewish heritage. There are still Jewish people that live in Morocco today, an Islamic country, and they still visit. So again, I will make comments and observations about what's going on in the conflict, but please take it in context. There's a population of Palestinians about three millions, four million, give or take, who are the right owners of part of the land, and they have been displaced and living in refugee camps and what have you, and and their aggression and their siege. And, uh, I'd say, I will also, at the same time, by the same token, say that the uh, Israelis and Israel, Israeli people, citizens, have the right to work, uh, to protect themselves, what have you. But I'll suggest that the, the means are extremely. When Israelis uh, siege uh, Gaza Strip in 2006, uh, uh, well, not 2014, uh, a complete blockade, and there, there was a, a, an onslaught from the sea, from the air, of the land. They were sending F 16 to bomb residential areas. So, that's brutal in my opinion. Probably many people's mind it is so. And where does that take? Well, for 
the local people is not an acceptable situation to, for all, all, all of us Muslims around the world because we feel this brotherly thing with the people of Palestine because why? We have a concept of the Ummah. Anybody has heard the word Ummah? It's a nation at large. We are a nation at large, no wars. If something happens to you here in the US and some your brother or somebody from your own faith in the Middle East will feel that pain. And we stand in solidarity with them. It's a big problem. It has not been resolved. Partly because of our policy. Again, this is one man's opinion. The Middle Eastern policy, the US policy over there has not been very fair. We are not the impartial peace broker that we would like to be. Uh, just last week, I think, uh, we signed a, uh, a $38 billion gift to Israel, sorry, between Obama and Netanyahu, and it's going to be used for weapons. Well, what are those weapons going to be fighting? Palestinians. Where? In residential areas. And cool. I want to tell you a funny story, and I hope you guys laugh. Talking about how we don't despise freedoms and what have you. There was a, uh, just a couple years back, uh, there was a Hezbollah fire uh, in, in Beirut. <coughs> a reporter is tracking him and trying to film that thing, and he's talking to him. He's like, what are you fighting for? He goes, I'm fighting for my faith, you know, for my freedom, man. And all these infidel guys are doing this stuff to us from the US and everywhere else. Man, I'm going to teach them a lesson or what have you. The guy goes, yeah, that's cool, man. And, and, and he's following him, tagging him, and finally he goes, okay, well, good luck to you. And the guy goes, no, wait, 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 I want to show you something. He reaches in his pocket and pulls out a paper, and he goes, I'm getting the hell out of here. I got my acceptance letter to go study in America. Yay. <laughs> I try. <laughs> no, but the idea is that as much as they don't like it, they, they want to come to the US. It's still a cool place. Misconception, right? Uh, okay. Uh, I'll make one more point about, again, what's going on uh, today, I guess, and as the uh, Arab Spring, and as you guys have heard, uh, from four years ago or so, there was a bunch of movements in, across the Middle East. Arab countries to change the regimes that happen in Libya, happens in Tunisia, happens in Egypt. Great hopes for change. It didn't happen. It didn't happen. It opened the land to more terrorists and more terrorist groups and more weapons. Libya had millions of guns that were in the hand, were in the hand of the government and then the government fell apart. And guess who got the guns and the weapons? The terrorists. Uh, so that, that adds fuel to the fire. We, and I say we as in uh, America, the foreign policy has not been able to support good movements for democracy, good, uh, valuable, and, and, and the valid guys we can work with. That didn't happen. Uh, so we opened up more fronts. We toppled, we helped topple the regime in, in, uh, in Libya, Gaddafi. We toppled Saddam Hussein, right? And what did we get in exchange? In exchange? Did we get stability? Did we get safety, security? Think not. But at the same time, the, the local population, when they see us supporting thugs, and I'll just use the, the word, Thugs either in uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, regimes that are not elected by the people, they are forced onto their own population, and yet we support them. Right? It, it doesn't make the people happy. It, it creates the hate and creates uh, this, uh, for some the desire to do something about it and to fight us. Again, guys, you can look at this stuff uh, later on. Uh, the, uh, the material will be available to you. 
Um, uh, I'd like to talk about secularism and the, the institutions we have in, in most of these Arab Islamic countries, uh, which is also a big, a big, a big key point here, as opposed to the, to the West, in the US, for example. We have democratic institutions. We have ways of resolving issues and conflict. We talk about stuff. We're looking forward. We are always think about ways to make people better. In the traditional societies, in, in, even in my home country, in Morocco, but mostly in the Middle East and the places where these conflicts are going on, people are looking backwards. They're not looking forward. They're looking backwards. ISIS wants to reestablish the Caliphate from 1,400 years ago. But no, we reject the West. We reject anything. You guys have just your infidels. Uh, you have no respect, no honor, debauchery, and we want to go back. So, East and West conflicts, they reject our, our, our ways in, in some respect. Recruitment. I think I have that coming later. Uh, Talk about suicide bombers, what have you. Okay. Uh, as far as uh, recruitment, uh, in, in my days when I uh, traveled and we were focused on Al Qaeda for, uh, as a, the main terrorist groups, uh, it was a, a lengthy and involved process to recruit somebody. There's an extremist <coughs> imam somewhere in a mosque, he gets people to listen to him, young men so, uh, of, of growing age, curious about things. They want to learn something different. They move from the general lecture or sermon <coughs> that the priest would give, and they take them to another smaller group for the guys who show interest and want to do something, and they say, yes, tell us more. And from there, you find an organization or somebody that will sponsor your travel, your trip. And you find yourself traveling through maybe Turkey or something and ended up in Afghanistan or in, uh, in Pakistan at the border Tribal, uh, tribal areas there, and you get into a training camp, and you learn. You get an indoctrination. It takes a long time to become totally like jihadi guy, and you hate the West and what have you. Read the Quran and get in-depth uh, knowledge uh, in an extreme way. But you learn how to shoot and learn, learn guns, and you become a, a soldier, basically. It's a long process. That has changed dramatically, drastically. You don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to go, go anywhere. A uh, young man or a woman even can sit there in front of that tube. You gotta do that, your generation. Watch a computer, uh, watch a, a video by ISIS, snazzy, good stuff, man. They utilize uh, hip hop stuff and you think you listen to Drake or Jay-Z or something. I mean, it's really catchy stuff. They show you bloody scenes and stuff. And for a young man, they show you how you can marry women out there. They'll, they'll secure a woman for you. It's a special thing. And so here you are. In front of the computer, you're being recruited. They'll give you a password. You go to a different chat with them, and you start talking to some guy. And they'll say, here, read this stuff. We'll show you how to make a bomb at home. Yeah, it's right there on the tube. You don't have to go anywhere. And you can take your own initiative how, what, how you want uh, to uh, express your hate. You can do an operation on your own. You don't have to touch nothing. The guy who did this thing a couple of days ago right, in, in New York, what was it? It was a pressure cooker bomb. A pressure cooker hot homemade thing. You can go on the computer on Google and find out how to make You can make that, that easy, <coughs> like that. So easy, right? Recruitment made easier, and uh, uh, what does that do for law enforcement and for intel and trying to track these guys? Does that make it hard? You better believe it. You don't know. You don't know. You don't know who you track.
Uh, of course, uh, you guys heard they have uh, tons of Twitter accounts and websites that change on a roll of a dime. They have guys who are really very crafty, very good at this uh, technology and uh, how to uh, handle uh, social media, what have you. They're really good at that stuff. Uh, yeah, there, there's a term that I like to use. They say it's uh, recruitment now is more MTV than Moss. That was a funny word. MTV. It's all snazzy flash, you know. Uh, State-sponsored terrorism, I guess. Uh, beyond the, just the groups we're talking about or individuals, there are states, as you know, like Iraq. Uh, it's been involved in, in stuff like that. Uh, North Korea, right? They've been doing some uh, hacking of our computers, and uh, and again, it's, these are you know uh, rogue countries, as they like to call them, who are involved in this stuff. And if you don't do it directly, they have their own groups that they sponsor to give them money to do stuff. So. Okay, the future, yay. What's the future like? <coughs> I go back to what I said earlier, guys. Uh, uh, this is something that's gotta be here with us. Your generation and the one after. When does it stop or where? I don't know. I don't know. We need to change what we're doing. There is one thing. We have not been able to tackle this properly to use the resources properly. You cannot throw guns and weapons and gazillions of dollars at the issue. You cannot just defeat this thing by security and guns and military. You cannot do that. It has not worked. It has not worked. Uh, since we opened the front in Afghanistan, and we said, yeah, great. We got them. We cornered uh, the Al Qaeda there. We cornered the Taliban. They were on the run. Wonderful. And then Mr. Bush went into Iraq. Well, uh, you know, the rest is history. We open up more fronts. It just, now they're running all over the place. We go into a country where there's no central government, no central authority. Every thug can be his own boss and recruit his own guys. It has not been fixed. Uh, ISIS was formed just in 2014. That's, that's, that's a couple of babies. I mean, it's not a long time ago. And before we knew it, they gained territory, territory like you wouldn't believe. So, who's to say what's going to happen next? I don't know. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. As long as we have the instability that we have in the Middle East. Uh, Syria, uh, Saddam uh, Bashar al-Assad was about to be toppled three years ago. And somehow, uh, China got involved with guns. Uh, Russia got involved. Militiamen from Iraq, from Iran, because the, the regime is the Shia regime, so Iran is supportive, and Bashar stayed on, and he's killing his own people in massive numbers. Ceasefire just uh, uh, was broken just a couple days ago. It ain't working. The methods are not working. Whatever we were doing has not worked. Okay, we're just fueling this thing. So, which brings me to the term that's being used now as the war for the hearts and the minds. The war for the hearts and the minds. Again, my question, what I said earlier, if we can determine the players and we have spent the billions, how come we cannot fix it? We need change. This, this got to be a change. Uh, you can't just send guns. You got to send a message, a good message, something that works. This is not a, a, a I don't think you can kill all the terrorists. I mean, uh, this is not a two standing armies going at each other and one is going to come up uh, as a conqueror or the winner. It's not going to happen. It's not two fighters in the ring and one is going to break the other guy down. Done. No. Uh, a war of attrition, as they, the term they use. I hate you, I'll send a bomb, and then go run into the, into the population, into somebody's house. Good luck trying to find me. 
bring all your guns and all your troops. You can't get them that, that way. So it is a war for the hearts and for the minds. We need to engage these guys. We need to engage them with a message of war. Their message that they recruit people with, with is strong, is direct, is powerful, has imagery, has stuff. We send a message saying, well, these guys are terrorists. They laugh at you. They say, well, you know, you're an infidel. What do you, what do you call me, terrorist? Look at you. Look what you're doing. As a, as a matter of fact, and I'll tell you the story. We were talking to a guy, and we were saying uh, in an interview, and somebody says, well, you guys are terrorists. You're bloody. You kill people, and, and they say, you are on the side of law, blah, blah, blah. And the guy goes, OK. Let's look at your own history, Mr. America. Who was the father of your country? George Washington, right? Yeah. Did he fight with a uniform? Yeah. Were they fighting soldiers with uniforms? Yes, they were fighting the British, red coats. The American Revolution was fought by people, but by a ragtime army fighters that fought inside the cities, too. So the guy goes, well, by definition, you, you guys are the first terrorist. Your father of your nation is a terrorist, too. So that makes us equal, OK? We're fine with that term, fine. We like you. I mean, that's a loose analogy. But the idea, our message has not been good enough. We throw money, we throw mm -hmm. guns and stuff, but we don't throw a good message. Here are some uh, ideas that work. Stuff I've been involved with personally. And Saudi Arabia, as one example, does very well with this. Saudis have created a program for reform, reform, ideological reform. So you would go to a family of a guy who's suspected to be fighting, say, in Syria or in Iraq or somewhere. They know they have traveled and disappeared. And they know they have been in touch with the family. Because why? Fighters like to call their mother a lot. Okay? Because if you don't get the blessing of your mother, you have nothing. That's another thing. It's an Islamic thing. So they go to the family and they say to the mother, listen, tell your son to come back home. Tell him to come back home. We're not going to do nothing to him. No persecution, no jail time, no nothing. And as a matter of fact, we're not going to cut off any support to you. Because back in the days, if you suspect that your son has left or something, the, the, the government will do nothing. All the police services is nothing. They might even jail some members of the family and say, bring your son and then you can leave. But they change. Tell your son to come back home. Nothing's going to happen to him. He's going to go to school. He's going to go to school before. We're going to talk to him. Yeah, and who's doing the talk? Not us, of course. Again, our message is not good, it's not acceptable. Their own. They recruited in Saudi Arabia guys who were former jihadists, former mujahid. Anybody use the word mujahid anymore? I think it's gone. Mujahid. Yeah, former guys. They come into a classroom and you will talk to these kids. And I say kids because the age group is 18, 19, 20, 25 looking for something. And they talk to them, and the uh, guy, the preacher, so he has to be a preacher. Why? He needs to talk from the same source, from the same reference, religious stuff, to convince these guys. And they'll tell them, look, the book of God says this. Why are you guys doing this stuff? Fighting the infidel. Whatever you find an infidel, you should slaughter them, cut off their heads. They say it, say it in the Quran. It is not a coincidence that Zarqawi, back in the days, used to show taped beheadings. It's cruel, right? They do it. I just it too. It's cruel. But they'll tell you, the book says so. The cartels in Mexico do the same thing, but they're not really the book. It's separate time. They're just cruel stuff. But for Islamics, it, it says that. But the preacher would say what? He says, no, brother, that's not. The verse continues, cut off their head, but if they choose peace with you, you must choose peace with them. You have to. 
If they go to a house of worship, you cannot persecute them. They can do nothing with them. You give them peace. You protect them. So you guys are wrong. Uh, it is not a coincidence that uh, Jews and Christians have lived under Islamic protection in the Middle East. The Middle East is predominantly Muslim, right? There are minorities of Christians and Jews. Jews actually live in Yemen, still live in Persia, live in Morocco, live in Pakistan. Never persecuted. Why? Because Islam says so. You protect them. They are the people of the book. So programs like this have done great, great work. They have done the results are wonderful. A lot of guys came back. They would listen to the preacher, who was a reformed one too, and who was what? He's credible. He's got street cred stuff. You guys have to say he was a modern term. Yeah, because the guy's been there to say to you, I have been there. I've been in your shoes, brother. This is not good. Start working. Uh, opportunity. Create an opportunity. If you are in Palestine or if you are in Iraq or even Syria right now, you have no opportunity. The, the economy is broken. There's nothing. So what are you going to do? Some guy says, you know, uh, just like the uh, adage, uh, 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 McDonald's is always higher. Well, uh, ISIS is always higher. Please, come join us. No problem. They'll give you cash and they give you stuff. Opportunity. Opportunity. Uh, I was working in Afghanistan, in Kabul, and uh, this huge equipment that comes from the US, big tanks and big transport stuff, billion of dollars worth of uh, money. And yet we drove on, I mean, inadequate roads, nothing. Inadequate infrastructure, nothing. So here we are bringing this huge equipment, this nothing for the local economy, for the local people. What if, what if we just hired, what, a couple hundred people or something, give them something to do, clean, fix the roads? Huh? Create opportunity, make them do something, whatever crap they have, sponsor that, make it happen. It doesn't cost a lot of money, by the way. It doesn't cost the gazillions that we spend on war. And incidentally, it, it'll, it'll give something for that guy to do, because when he has nothing, what is he gonna do? He's gonna fight, basically. Opportunity. Uh, policy. And that, that's always a hard one, that's always a hard one. Uh, uh, Dr. Reedy was talking a minute ago, we were saying that uh, uh, when we design policy, we don't really talk about policy, really. We talk about strategy. We talk about tactics, something at a lower level. What, I'm, what I mean by that? Uh, U.S. policy has always been guided by these strategies to win little wars for a little time. You know, we want to topple the, the regime in, in Iraq. Great. What are we going to do after? I don't know. Right? Short term vision. We don't look deep. What are we going to establish for that society that we're going to break apart now? What are we going to do? I don't know. So. We need to think of those terms and the long term, what you gotta put in place. And don't tell me democracy. Nothing against democracy, but it's a Western term. They, they have their own faith. They have their own ways. We're talking about tribal stuff. Tribal stuff. Yeah. We were working in, in, in Afghanistan early on in 2002. And I was traveling with a bunch of friends, and including the Afghans, and we would go to a village some remote area, and we say, hey, listen, the Taliban is gone. We got it free, and we have a central government now. You have you guys elected a new president, Hamid Karzai. And they go, who? Hamid Karzai, the new president, where? In Kabul. He goes, no, 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 I live in the village here. I don't know Hamid, I know chief, so-and-so. He's the boss. He tells me what to do. We need to support that, that, that if we can help those chieftains, those villagers to do well, 
and promote their own whatever lifestyle, whatever we want to do. We cannot impose stuff on them. It's, a, it's just not happening. As a matter of fact, in Iraq, if you had the purple thing that meant that you voted that day, that was a, <laughs> you were a sign off your life. That was a, you're, you're a target now. You're fine to shoot you. So we need to do those things. You know, soft. It's not hardcore. It's not beat up. Dialogue. I would say engage, talk. And the, and, and the policy in the US goes what? We don't talk to terrorists. What are they to differ? We do. Yeah, yeah, it happens. I cited on some of those talks. We just don't want to talk about it. We just paid a big ransom in Iran to free the, what is it, journals or something? We paid a ransom to free a guy, who's a soldier in Afghanistan. We gave him five Taliban fighters, we gave us one guy. So we do talk to terrorists. And we should. We should. Remember, if you can't kill them, and you cannot kill them all, well, figure out a way. Talk with them. They have stuff. They have things they want from you. They have their own gripe and grief about stuff, and we have, we have, we have to listen. Let me suggest to you, and I'm going to go off a little bit tangent here, I'm going to go a little bit on a limb. People don't like to hear this. ISIS had a claim on a territory a caliphate, right? An Islamic State. And they defined it well. It's going to be, because the leaders were from Baghdad, from, from Iraq. And it was in Mosul, it was the capital. ISIS did not go it by itself. They did not force the population to follow them. I suggest this to you. They have a lot of support from local people, from the tribal chieftains. They were happy with that thing. If we had said, Okay, fine, have your own state. We're good with that. In my opinion, it may have solved the problem. We may have contained them and just keep an eye. Because as you fight somebody, they're scared and they're going to fire you back up. You corner a dog somewhere and he's going to try to bite you. A better example may be a Taliban. The Taliban was a legit government in Afghanistan. There was nothing wrong with that. They're a government. They have a population, they have people, they have their own institutions. We talk to them. They have control. Here's a word for you guys. They control that situation so it doesn't get out. This is the opinion of one, of a man, one person, okay? You don't have to subscribe to it, but I'm just suggesting things to you guys. And I'd like to finish with that, as a matter of fact. Um, I challenge you guys to open your mind to this stuff. Research, read about it. It's gonna affect you now, your future, your careers. The future, the next generation, what have you. Put some pressures on them, your representatives and lawmakers and whatever, tell them to do a better job because they're not doing it. Read about this stuff, it's good. It's good stuff, it affects all of us. It affects all of us, not just the law enforcement guy or the Angel guy. When you go to the mall and you're scared to go shopping now because the stupid guy in Indiana decided to hack some people. That could happen here, it could be anywhere. And uh, I'd like to think I'm, a, uh, I'm an optimist and I uh, hope there will be some answers. And I hope we can uh, uh, defeat this thing with all of us. Thank you. Shukran. Ask a question, uh, feel free. I, I don't mind. Just out of curiosity, yes, sir. Uh, how did this, what after the Saudis pioneered their de-radicalization program? Yeah. How did they decide that somebody had in fact been de-radicalized? Yeah. Well, the, the intel they had good information that those guys were fighting somewhere. They tapped the telephones of our families. Remember what I said? They anybody's out there? He's talking to mom. He's talking right. to dad. Right. When the guy disappears, he was in school and he was no longer in school. You know, they track. Yeah. They know no, they were. Somebody, 
somebody has been, been uh, caught <coughs> and is going through a de-radicalization program, yeah. okay? So they're here, we're, you know, the, yeah. we got the, you know, sort of the, the, uh, the, the Saudi imams talking to them and, yes. and, and whatnot. Now, how do I know that that guy's been de-radicalized? Okay. Uh, a, they gotta place them in jobs, they gotta work. Okay. Yeah, there, there's, there's a government supervision. They're gonna, they're gonna give something to do. They wanna pursue school, fine. As a matter of fact, the Saudi now goes a step beyond and they monitor all the teachers. Uh, I'm going on tangent here, but, but it makes the point too. In Saudi Arabia, most teachers are not Saudis. They come from Egypt, from Sudan, from other places, who may carry what? Ideology that is not pro Saudi Arabia. So they stop monitoring that, that stuff too, to make sure so everybody almost, speaks the same. Almost analogous to rehabbing a criminal offender? Yeah, yeah, basically. Yeah. So uh, you get a certification too. You have to graduate. <laughs> yeah, you can certify. But they keep an eye. Yes. Come on, guys. Give me a question. Yes. Uh, aspect of it. So you said like the Quran is said behead those who yes. are infidels, but if they're in one of the houses, then then give them if they offer. Yeah. Give them. Give, give them. So what if you don't belong to so like Christianity or Judaism? Then you're just like completely on your own. That's it. You gotta fend for yourself. No, 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 no. If they don't fight you, is it is another? I didn't elaborate. Only those who stand against who wants to fight fight. Them. Go and seek a, uh, a refuge somewhere, then they, they're fine. Okay. Yeah, they're fine. But in, in Islam, I mean, your relationship is, is, is you with God. Nobody has to tell you what to do. There's no coercion in Islamic faith by the scripture. Nobody has to punch you to do something. It, this, is, this, this whole thing, man, this ideology stuff, is, is not really reading the text correctly. Uh, let me ask you that. The Islamic history has been a history of enlightenment. You guys don't know that because it's not now. The Wahhabism that started all this stuff was in the 1800s in Saudi Arabia. 1800. We have a history of 1400 years, 1500 years now. In Damascus, where the bloody place now, or Iraq, or Baghdad, is another uh, uh, rundown. Bad place. Those were houses of enlightenment. They were schools, universities that taught uh, not Islam. They taught science, uh, math. You know, mathematics came was taught by the, uh, the, 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 the Arabs, algebra, all this stuff. Religion was not meant to go the way it's going now. It was not that. It was enlightenment. Arab philosophers and thinkers and scientists were curious about what Europeans were doing. They read the works of Plato and Aristotle, the Greek stuff, and translated, developed it, translated it into Arabic and into modern languages. Your, and I say your, European Renaissance came out of, was a gift from the Arabic civilization. That's a fact. So this stuff we're doing with today is strange, even to me. As a man from the faith, from that, that area, it's strange to me. I don't recognize it. It's not who we are, for the most part. Three questions. Yes, sir. So you talked about the history. Um, what about uh, like after World War One and after World War Two, like the before World War One? A lot of those places were under uh, sort of empire. Yes. Empire rule. It was like the Ottomans and that. Yeah. Uh, Correct. So, was there? I mean, is there is there history of terrorism under that rule, or is this more of a modern, um, yeah. <coughs> modern thing after they sort of got uh, you know born out of nationalism? Good question. Very good question. Mm -hmm. uh, again, if you look across the Middle East, man, those countries did not even exist back then, right? There was a rule: the Ottoman Empire. Mm -hmm. There was no Jordan or Palestine or not even Israel, not even Lebanon. Uh, so the real terrorism really started with uh, Lawrence of Arabia. There's a terrorist for you. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm laughing, but uh, really, uh, uh, Lawrence of Arabia gathered 
the tribal guys to fight the Ottomans and kick them out. And the Brit, the British gave a promise to a man by the name of King Hussein that he shall have, he shall rule the area. As the British did do oftentimes, well, they broke the rule or the promise they didn't do it, they didn't stay there. So there was a movement, a Zionist movement that was aiming at creating the state of Israel instead of giving rule to some homegrown, well, the king was saying himself. He, he was uh, uh, he was in the Shah from, from uh, the Levant, not Palestine, not Jordan, but from the area. So because we didn't create, we did, the British did not keep a promise and created a, a valid a government, a kingdom that, that's local, then, you know, Israel came in, uh, they took some land, some, they bought some land, and they took some land by force, and that created a conflict. Basically, I mean, I'm giving you a very rough uh, sort of uh, history there. Yeah? Anybody else? Yes, sir. You mentioned um, kind of allowing ISIS to establish their own state and contain them, but yeah. does ISIS have a lot of really um, kind of oppressive um, rules on society, especially like with women and things? Wouldn't that lead to a lot of yeah. human rights issues? Yeah, sure. 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 Does North Korea has an oppressive regime? Yeah. Huh. <coughs> I mean, what do you do? Burma has. Uh, I'm not saying that it's a great way to do things or to uh, uh, rule your own people. No, it's not right. Than what we but now. It's yeah. exactly. Okay. They did what happened after we start fighting about stuff. Now they stop right. going outside. They recruit outside in the U.S. and other places. But it's a state. It's not supposed to be global. They want a state. They want an Islamic state. Now, if you have an Islamic state, why are you why are you fighting here in, in, in America? Why in uh, England? It changed. Uh, all I'm saying from a security standpoint, we would have been able well, to yeah, contain, we we can, we can keep an eye. And they will establish their own brutal rule, whatever, and people will, will submit to it. If you don't like it, you're going to leave, right? But you would not have this global thing. My opinion. When I said that Umar meant a nation at large, yes. I didn't fully understand that. Can you elaborate? Yes, I didn't say fully. Thank you. Thank you. No borders. Okay. We don't have borders. And Burma does not recognize, well, this is the state of Palestine, and this is uh, Jordan, this is Saudi. No, we are all Muslims. We should be ruled by the rule of God, by the Sharia law. Right? And, and, and that's the idea. Did I explain it? Yeah. Any last questions? Um, yes, sir. Talks about like if it, if it exists, like a state exists that's not like it's oppressive to people, they should leave. Like that kind of brings them on the immigrant crisis right now. Like, should we take more immigrants? But like, yeah, doesn't that put a burden like? An oppressive state that exists and just sends people away, or that everybody can get out of if they don't like it, is not a burden on the rest of the world in that sense? Yes, good point. Good point. Good point. Well, would that be, is that a problem as big as what we have now? So would we, we, we have people who probably leave in to seek freedom somewhere else, as opposed to we have fighters who are going outside trying to find alliances outside because they're being smoked out of places in Mosul and other places. Uh, I mean, I'm just throwing that out there. I don't know if there is really a really a good, good solution. But what I'm saying, containment, in my opinion, would have done a better job than just, you know, keep fighting these guys and have them leave and find uh, organize other groups in Syria. And now we have no government in Syria, so they're they're, they're happy there because they they love chaotic, chaotic situations and. And, and seeking revenge upon us by what sending videos and recruiting guys online and here in the U.S. and England and other places. So I don't know. I really don't have but real answers. But I, you know, 
So All right. I would like to uh, thank Professor Edelbrook for being with us today and enlightening us. Thank you. 